upon completion of this chapter, you'll be able to describe the steps a healthcare worker should take in preparing him or herself for a venipuncture procedure. List of supplies and equipment used in a typical venipuncture procedure. Describe the detailed steps in the patient's identification process and what to do if the information is missing. Describe the methods and uh, rationale for hand hygiene. Identify the most appropriate sites for venipuncture and situations when these sites might not be accessible. Identify alternative sites for venipuncture procedure. Describe the process and time limits for applying tourniquet to a patient's arm. Describe the documentation process and the agents used to de decontaminate the skin for routine blood tests and blood cultures. Describe the steps of a venipuncture procedure using the evacuated tube method, syringe method, and butterfly method according to CLSI approved standards. Describe the order of draw for collection tubes. Describe how to react when the patient has fainted or experienced nausea, vomiting, or convulsions. Define and explain the clinical reasons for the terms fasting, stat, and time specimen. Blood collection. Preparation includes hand hygiene and reviewing laboratory test orders. Prepare the work area. Approach, identify, and register patient. Assess patient's physical disposition. Select and prepare equipment or supplies. Position patient's arm, uh, uh, position patient, apply a tourniquet and find a puncture site. Choose a venipuncture method. Prepare venipuncture site. Collect specimen and appropriate tubes and collect in correct order. Activate safety device and discard contaminated supplies. Label samples before transport. Double check identity of the specimen with patient. Assess the patient, ensure bleeding has stopped. Thank patient for cooperation. Maintain hand hygiene after procedure. Activate needle safety device and discard contaminated supplies. Label specimens prior to transporting. Assess patient to ensure bleeding has stopped and thank the patient. Maintain hand hygiene. Consider any special circumstances. Assess criteria for specimen recollection or rejection. Prioritize patient and specimen tubes. Transport and store specimens appropriately. Right. Here uh, is the flow chart for how the venipuncture process should be performed. Preparing for the patient encounter, rationale, to help the healthcare worker mentally focus on importance of the individual patient and prepare for the Pacific venous blood collection. Preparation, prepare and assemble PPE, phlebotomy supplies, test requisitions, labels, writing pens, appropriate patient information before patient encounter, and prior to venipuncture process. All right, here you see the uh, Phlebotomy supplies and a commercial available, commercially available carts or trays. Keep work area or counter space clean and free of debris. What a well stocked phlebotomy workstation looks like. Procedure. 
present positive professional appearance and temperament, take deep cleansing breaths before beginning, focus on the individual patient. And you see here a healthcare worker who is waiting to interact with a patient. If the patient's information is incomplete, obtain assistance from a supervisor or a nurse before collecting the sample. If there is sens sensitivity to latex procedure, Use nitrile, polyethylene, other non-latex gloves. Use non-latex tourniquets and bandages. Keep patient calm by explaining the procedure and answering any questions related to venipuncture. Issues and hand hygiene. Choosing a hand hygiene product it is effective against pathogens. Is the product accessible, easy to use, with minimal irritation? Are there issues related to soap dispenser? Uh, practice of topping off Partially filled containers can lead to bacterial contamination. Right, yeah, it goes back to something that you all heard me refer to before about checking the supply levels. It's not just one person's job, it's everyone's job. Other aspects of hand hygiene. Use hand lotions to minimize dermatitis. Keep fingernail tips less than a fourth of an inch long. Do not wear artificial fingernails or extenders. Change gloves between patients. And these are things that I've spoke about uh, in the past. Ladies, I understand we like getting, our, getting the nails done. But keep in mind the area that you're, that you're working in. All right, you don't want stuff, you don't want to have long fingernails and have things getting, run the risk of something getting under your fingernails. Um, now you're taking, you, you don't clean your hands properly. You don't clean under your fingernails properly. Um, you put, you go on, you, you go in, you interact with, um, go in and interact with a patient your unclean hands now touches the gloves. Oh, now we've contaminated gloves in the box. Um, when we take the gloves off, again, we don't wash our hands properly. We're not scrubbing under our fingernails. Um, then we go eat something. Now all those germs and bacteria that's under our fingernails, we're bringing this stuff. We're bringing these things into our into our home, putting our own health at risk. So. And it's imperative that we just take care of all this stuff on the back end. All right. Minimize it, keep the nails short, and we won't have any problems. Let's see here, this is typically what your fingernails should look like. All right. Rationale for hand hygiene and gloving technique. To protect patient and healthcare workers from exposure to infectious substances and to prevent transmission of infectious agents. That's exactly what I just said. Remember, use of gloves does not eliminate need for hand hygiene, nor does good hand hygiene eliminate need for gloves. Perform high hand hygiene before and after patient use. Use new gloves for each patient. Um, again, just try to follow this to the best of your ability. 
I spoke about this may vary depending on where you work, but for the most part, you may you want to make sure that you change gloves in between every patient. Use hand hygiene method, decontaminate sterilized hands, use an alcohol-based hand rub or wash with antimicrobial soap or water. Soap and water. If hand is visibly dirty or contaminated, always use soap and water. Use amount of sterile of uh, use amount of sanitizer soap recommended by man manufacturer. And then you see someone sanitizing their hands, moisturizing and sanitizing to their hand. When hands are dry, snap the fingers, slip the fingers of one hand into a clean glove, pull the glove taunt with the other hand so that there is no slack or bagginess of the gloves and the fingertips. Right? This is why um, this is important. It's something I've seen with you all. You definitely want to make sure that those gloves fit snug to your hand. You don't want them to be saggy. You don't want to have any um, extra space in, in between your fingers and the gloves and the patient. Because as you all see that when you guys go to tie the tourniquet, sometimes the excess glove gets caught up in the tourniquet. It makes it hard for you to identify the vein. Um, so please make sure that you get gloves that fit. Right. Typically at the school, we'll have um, extra large down to small. We can order extra small gloves if need be. Um, so please make sure that you have the right size glove on. Right. So here we see someone down in gloves. That they fit pretty, yeah, they, they're fitting pretty snug. This is them removing their glove. So they took that thumb and put it under the wrist part and pulled that over. This uh, is refreshing from what you all learned in uh, CPR. And once they add that, that glove, that first glove off, it's being held in the glove hand, repeating the process, taking that thumb and placing it under the, the, the wrist part of the glove and you're gonna pull that over the top of that other glove, encasing the first glove that was taken off inside that other glove. So now all the, the contaminated area is now inside on both gloves. I'm going to discard the gloves with biohazard material unless the healthcare, healthcare facility specifies otherwise. Okay. Anytime that you deal with a patient and get something on it, put it in the bio unless your employer is like, just put gloves in the trash or what have you, whatever policies they have in place. All right, so issues in hand hygiene. Indication for hand washing, cleansing. If visibly dirty, contaminated, or sore, wash them with either antimicrobial microbial soap and water or use non-antimicrobial soap and water. If not visibly sore, use alcohol-based hand sanitizer or antimicrobial soap and water. Antimicrobial soap and water, wet hands with water, apply amount of product recommended by manufacturer, 
uh, vigorously rub hands together for at least 15 seconds. Uh, 20 is, is ideal, but you need to do it for at least for 15. Cover all surfaces of hands and fingers. Um, you know, they have different techniques, different things they suggest that you do to ensure that you're washing your hands long enough, singing happy birthday, singing your ABCs. I uh, just want to make sure that you are getting your hands clean. All right. Um, rinse hands with water. Dry thoroughly with clean, disposable towel. Do not use multi-use cloth towels. Right, because there's multi-use, that means you're, you're using it for multiple things, and all the the last bits of like residue or dirt that may be on your hand has now been um, is now being transferred to that towel, and that towel is going to be placed on the counter or used to wipe something down. So now we're just spreading these germs around. Use disposable towels, use your paper towels, throw these things away. Reduce the amount of, reduce the, the spread of bacteria. Indication of hand washing and cleansing, uh, decontaminate clean hands, clean this hands before and after contact with the patient, blood or body fluids. Cleanse before and after wearing gloves. Right. Cleanse before eating and after using a restroom. And I always found this to be extremely odd. We always encourage individuals to wash their hands after using a restroom to me it just makes it makes a lot more sense to wash your hands before going in the bed before you use the bathroom because you got to think how many times how many things could you have possibly touched on your way to the bathroom you had to open the door close the door lock it turn the light switch on all these things who knows when the last time they they've been clean or how many people have touched them prior to you and then you're going to go touch on yourself yeah that's that just never set right with me. I always wash my hands before and after. Um, Antimicrobial wipes are not as effective as alcohol-based hand rubs or um, the antimicrobial soap and water. Needle stick injuries occur due to According to the CDC, type and design of needle device used, recapping needle, transferring body fluids between containers and proper needle disposal. This is why, again, it's important, it's imperative that we follow the steps that you pull if you're using a double-sided needle. As soon as you pull that, after you remove the tube, invert the tube, place that gauze over the site, and you pull that needle out, go ahead and, and activate the safety, the safety device by tapping it on the table. Do not use your hand because you can easily stick yourself with the needle. Um, the needle may be brittle. You're trying to close it with your with your hand. You could break the needle the needle off and stab yourself that way. There's multiple ways that you could that things could go. And you just, and you just never know. So it is better to be safe then sorry. What employers can do, analyze Sharps injuries to identify hazardous trends, set priorities for prevention, ensure proper training and use and disposal of Sharps, modify work practices that are hazardous, What employers can do 
promote safety awareness, provide high risk employees with free hepatitis vaccines, encourage timely timely encourage timely reporting of injuries, evaluate exposure to control plan accordingly. Um, follow safe, follow safety and follow up procedures. If you are injured, report exposure immediately to a responsible department, employee health and patient control, or your supervisor. What um, select safe safest needle products available? Help employers select and evaluate safety devices. Avoid recapping needles before procedure. Plan for safe handling and needle disposal. All right, select safe, safest needle products available. Again, this is going to be solely dependent on where you work and what their budget is. They may not be able to afford, you know, needles with the built-in safety lock device. Um, so that's why it's important that you know how to protect yourself from needle sticks and work with, um, and exercise caution. Um, and we we'll spoke multiple times about why you never recap a needle, again, because you're uh, you are highly susceptible to a needle stick. Um, and before procedure plan for safety handling of needle disposal. And this is why we practice so much on these steps for performing venipuncture, because repetition is the father of learning. Now. We can go over something thousands and thousands of times. If you are not making a conscious effort to memorize this stuff, you will never memorize it. Okay? You have to do more than just do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You have to force yourself to learn the procedure. Okay, it's again, it's not just something where you're going to build up muscle memory to it. You have to walk, talk yourself through it. So therefore, it's being coded into your mind what needs to happen. Right? To safety first. We don't want to have any any incidents now or in the future. Ever. So please, please, again, we'll continuously encourage you all to make sure that you study the steps so we will not have these problems. Coordinate specimen collection to reduce number of times needles need uh, used on patient. Proper dispose of used needles and proper sharps disposal containers. Report all needle sticks and sharps related injuries promptly. Tell your employer about hazard, hazard, hazards from needles overused observed in the work environment. Participate in bloodborne pathogen training and follow infectious prevention practices such as hepatitis B vaccines. Follow policies and procedures established by the employer. Um, things change all the time, and a lot of times you aren't made aware of things. So whenever you hear something about um, a free training being offered, please, please utilize those, those free trainings. Okay, because something may have changed, and you could find yours. You could easily find yourself out of compliance quick. Again, safety first. Never think that you know everything. Learn as much as you possibly can.
inform employees about hazards observed in the work environment to participate in bloodborne pathogen training, follow infectious prevention practices, such as hepatitis B vaccines. Um, and it's just repetitive. Um, initial introduction patient approach. Um, when entering the patient's hospital room, knock on the door. Do not pound loudly. If patient is asleep, Turn on a low light at first. Speak quietly but professionally. Introduce yourself and state the purpose of the interaction. Explain the procedure as you set up. If the physician or nurse is consulting with the patient, specimen collection procedure um, is delayed until the cons consultation is completed. Okay. Um, again, it's just proper chain of command. You're the lab tech, and you have people ahead of you, which would be your, your nurses and your physicians. You never walk in the room and try to overtalk them. All right. Patiently wait your turn and then execute what it is that you came in there for. Um, and this is also because you don't want to confuse the patient. All right. Physical disposition of the patient, diet, alcohol, exercise, smoking, tendency to faint, latex sensitivity, stress, age, arm preference, weight. These are all things that you take into consideration when dealing with a patient prior to phenopuncture. Here we see a um, a woman who has grown nauseous, and the healthcare worker has placed the ice pack on her neck. If I mentioned this a couple chapters ago, in the event that a patient becomes faint, what you should do with the with the ice packs, you want to put one behind their neck, put one on their chest, get a cold compress, and put on their head just to bring their body temperature down, so they they are not they are not as nauseous. Factors that cause pre-analytical um, vulnerability include age, gender, diet, and exercise, blood type. Um, Circadian uh, and seasonal rhythms, smoking, chewing gum, tobacco, alcohol intake. And all these things play a factor in the procedure. So if the patient was instructed to fast prior to the collection of specimen and they are eating chewing gum, then hey, we need to find out, contact the nurse or physician to find out that we need to reschedule the test or if we can go forward with the test, we need to make sure that we document it. Um, if you smell that they, they smell like they just finished smoking a cigarette, same thing. Definitely they smell like they have, they drink and consume alcohol because alcohol thins the blood out and you definitely don't want to go stick someone and run the risk of them um, bleeding excessively, excessively. Excessively, excuse me. That's right. so why the pre, the pre, and uh, the pre examination process is vital. All right. Um, medications, IV use, IV lines, or uh, vascular access devices, uh, menstrual cycle, pregnancies, menopause, emotional stress, needle phobia, uh, psychiatric disorder, and all these things. We, we have to assess all of these things. All of these things. All right. Here is a device to assist in patient uh, positioning the patient's arm. Uh, 
the different types of blood collection chairs. Uh, you've been in the lab, you see that we have we have B and C. The test requisition should contain the patient's ID, name, unique identification, registration number, location, date of birth, specimen code, gender, test to be performed, date and time of collection, or uh, status, time, stat, fasting, etc. All this should be on your test requisition form. Special precautions, um, if they're a bleeder, um, the proper medical term for that would be homophilia, homophiliac, homophilia, uh, so when that bleeds excessively, um, faints easily, latex sensitivity, uh, clinical information, sources of specimen, billing information, when appropriate, uh, diagnostic code and physician signature. All the things that we're checking for on our requisition. All right, if our requisition is missing any of this stuff, before we can even interact with the patient, we need to we need to make the corrections on our requisition. Check request prior to venipuncture procedure. Uh, discrepancies, um, duplicates, missing information. And that's what I was just saying about your, your requisition. So what your, your bleed labels will look like, your requisition labels. Um, the rationale, to use appropriate patient identifiers for blood specimens, thereby promoting patient safety and accuracy of the laboratory testing results. All right. Uh, we're in a new section now. Then read the title. Uh, basic of patient identification. Want to greet the patient, identify him or her, him or herself, and state their department. Indicate the purpose of the encounter. Allow patient chance to respond and give implied consent via a gesture, and and or note the patient's refusal for procedure. We talked about this in one of the earlier chapters about implied consent um, you want to make sure that you that you get consent from from them all right and it could be a couple different reasons why you know they don't want to interact with you maybe they got nervous um, maybe they they aren't feeling well if you come in and you don't seem to know what you're talking about, you're stumbling over your words, dropping stuff. You know, that would make the patient uncomfortable. Um, sad to say, you know, race could play a factor. They may not like the fact that you have a tattoo. They might not like the way you look. They might not like the way you smell. Maybe you maybe you have on a, a perfume or a lotion or something that they're allergic to. So that, that's making them feel some type of way. All these things play into this. All right. Try to get an answer as to why and document. So if it's not documented, it did not happen. It's something you will learn real, real quick with men in the field. If it's not documented, it didn't happen. There needs to be a paper trail for everything. Okay, if fasting is required, ask when was the last time you you ate or drank anything, note the dietary effects, ask about latex sensitivity, fainting, and arm preference. And we'll see that in the next couple of pictures coming up. All right. See here she's interacting with the patient, going over her questions. Uh, like he's showing her ID, so she's verifying that his information is correct with what she has on her requisition there in her left hand uh, and she's still verifying 
and she's getting ready to, to hand it back to him. All right. Approaching, assessing, identifying the patient, patient identification process. Most crucial responsibility for which a healthcare worker is held accountable. Correct patient identification is critical throughout all phases of laboratory testing. The Joint Commission suggests the use of at least two patient identifiers. Okay? Neither to be the patient's room number when they're providing care, treatment, or service. I always want to make sure that we have two forms of identification. So the two-step verification process. Always. Patient identification process procedures vary slightly depending on location, inpatient and outpatient or emergency room, type of patient, pediatric or adult, whether patients conscious or unconscious, um, available information at the time, armband or picture ID. Inpatient identification, all patients except those entering the ER must wear an ID armband or bracelet. Armband must have first and last names and designated hospital number, long-term care facilities or psychiatric units may not require armbands for vitamins, must verify identity with a nurse or provide a charge for a provider in charge. Outpatient ambulatory patient identification. If calling patient's name from a rating, rating room, be careful to state only the name and not to reveal any confidential clinical information. Ambulatory patients may take longer to identify. Photo ID is preferred. Identification of patients who are comatose, semi-comatose, or sleeping. Awaken patient before collecting and verifying patient ID. If patient is comatose or semi-comatose, a nurse, relative, or friend may identify the patient by providing patient's name, address, identification number, and or birthday. And it's only if that patient, if we can't, that patient cannot give us this information that's the only time we will seek information from someone else in the room to verify this information now of course if it's a child you want you can't expect a child to give you all this information some may be able to but you would definitely consult with the with the parent if the child is is fairly young all right and even if they are, even if the, the child is um, able to give it to you, still verify with the with the parent because they could have easily made a mistake. And we know as kids grow, uh, they they as they're learning the language, they can't always articulate every letter and si syllable. So therefore, again, it's just an added an added safety measure. Double checking that with with mom. We'll talk about that. Um, in a later chapter um, when dealing with children in the um, in the field um, compare with information on requisition labels to confirm identity in discrepancies reported to your supervisor um, preferable to use sample identification procedures for both child, children, and adult. Nurse, guardian, relative may identify infant or child by providing name, address, identification number, birth date. Name of verifier should be documented. All right. Temporary master identification may be provided until positive identification can be made. When permanent identification number is assigned, temporary identification number, cross-reference to a permanent number.
patients with severe burns or in isolation. Only circumstances in which a healthcare worker may use a bleed label identification tag to confirm identity. It's the only time. These rare occasions are subject to additional institutional policies. High risk situations, um, siblings, twins, newborns, common names or similar names, multiple patients sharing common room. And we talked about these things um, in the in the past. Some of our previous lectures, you guys can go back and, and check those out. Um, I, I brought these. I brought this up. Why it's important to identify the the patient properly because people do have twins and people have common names. And we're in a hospital. Of course, people are going to share rooms. That's why you don't want to just use the the room number and things of that nature. Okay. Identity areas are preventable. Most identity areas are due to inaccurate requisitions, mixed up paperwork, failure to follow identification process. And stated just stated earlier in this lecture that the requisition is what you're going to get first. When we review that requisition, if anything is out of line on that requisition, immediately consult with someone. Because if we overlook that requisition, now we we on us we on we're on a slippery slope. You know what I'm now we we're setting ourselves up to partake in a series of events that can spiral out of hand real quick. Can be life threatening to patient, grounds for legal action against employee or employer or both, grounds for termination from employment. Right. Chapter three, we talked about malpractice and things of that nature. And this is why all this stuff is important. And this is why I strongly, strongly encourage you guys to make sure that you know this stuff. Because again, like performing venipuncture, this is what for bottom is. Performing venipuncture. All right. And all these things are fundamental to the success, your success in doing this. You can't skip a step. All right. Equipment selection and preparation. Supplies of venipuncture, gloves, disposable latex or non-latex alternatives without powder, lubricant, or cotton gloves worn underneath latex gloves. Tourniquets, single-use disposable latex-free, antiseptics, alcohol packs, skin disinfectant, and uh I spoke about how when it comes to when it comes to tourniquets, again, this is gonna be it's gonna be at the company's discretion. They may not have you throw them out. They may have you all put them put them to the side and have them clean later on at the um later on in the day. Whatever the policy is for your company, that's what you follow. Don't go in, are we supposed to throw these away? Hey, this is what this is what they're doing here. Please comply. Please. Now, if there's something that you don't feel comfortable with, then okay. Then, you know, go ahead and take the necessary steps. Go ahead and start seeking employment somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? Instruct them that you don't feel comfortable doing that. Non-alcoholic antiseptics and chloroxidine prep kicks, packaged gauze pads, no cotton balls, hyperallergenic adhesive bandages and gauze wraps, glass microscope slides. Okay, um, you definitely never want to use cotton balls because if anyone has ever seen a cotton ball, um, as it pertains to blood, you know when you when they're doing capillary sticks, you ever had to get your finger stuck and they 
give you the cotton ball. You know, like after about two, three minutes when you have that cotton ball on there and you go to pull it off, you have all those little, you have cotton stuck there in that wound. And that's why you don't want to use cotton balls. Uh, Gauze are the best way to go. All right. All right, sterile needles and with single use evacuate tube holders and wing infusion sex, plastic capillary tubes with tube sealer, sterile syringes and syringe transfer devices, blood collection tubes, laboratory requisitions or labels, ice or, or refrigerant for appropriate specimens. Warning devices for diluting blood, for dilating blood vessels. Warming device for appropriate specimen, marking pens, puncture proof disposal containers, laboratory test resource manual. All right. Four point supply check. Check expiration dates on all supplies. Inspect needles for defective signs. Check the needle is securely attached to holder. Assure needle needles capable uh, compatibility with the holders. All right here, you see the um, vein circulation. See how the veins look in the arms um, and what the, the those veins are called. And I also encourage you all to um, learn the learn the names um, of the veins and where they're located. Right here, you see um, healthcare worker palpating the vein. You see that you have your uh, your median cubicle um, vein, The cephalic vein is not so uh, is not being shown in, in picture B. Uh, the basalic vein uh, can be seen. Um, and you can see you see your your cephalic and basalic veins in C, which you don't really see your 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 median cubital uh, vein. Right, just shows uh, vein variations, um, what they look like based off um, race, gender, and age. Right. Here are your arm veins, arteries, and your nerves. Let me see it. Your veins are blue, your arteries are red, and your nerves are yellow. Right. punch of site selection. Factors that affect superficial vein characteristics include weight, physiological conditions, gender, gender, physical features, skin tone and color, wrinkles, etc. Uh, yeah. Anticubital area or arm preferred venipuncture site, anticubital vein uh, locates H-shaped or slanted H or N or M-shaped depending on uh, way the cephalic median cubital uh, cephalic veins um, are distributed in the arm. Veins in the center, which is a median or anticubital area. Veins in the outer, which is lateral area, edge of arm. Veins located in the inner side of the anticubital area. All right, so here you see the veins in the hands in A and B, and 
showing you what good hand veins look like. You never want to stick on that back side, the back side of the wrist. Those veins back there are very, very prominent in just about everyone, but they are really, really small, um, and you definitely never, never, ever want to use those. Uh, and you see, like in B, how um, we talk about people having rolling veins. If you look at B, you see how they're pushing the vein. The vein is being pushed to the side of it. That's why it's important that when you find that vein, that you anchor that vein down because they can be easily moved. Okay, by just by your your patient's respirations. Find that vein, anchor it so that you don't lose it. Do not use arm veins in these conditions. Um, IV burn the scar areas, areas with hematoma. Uh, cast, uh, thrombose veins, endomyotis, uh, mitosis arms, partial uh, radical mastectomy on one or both sides. Tools to make difficult veins more prominent. Tourniquet, position the arm downward and relax. Use gravity to fill veins. Um, warm the puncture site. Venoscope. Uh, trans Trans simulator, um, AccuVein viewing system, or an ultrasound. And here you see uh, it's a disposable warming pack placed on the arm. Again, warming the site up is going to increase the blood flow. Once the blood is warm, it um, tends, tends to, to, to thin out, it's going to flow a lot smoother. It's going to make the vein more prominent. All right? This is the AccuVein. See, so use the infrared light to uh, identify the veins. Again, no, we do not have these, and no, you will not get these. All right. Use of a tourniquet and vein palpation, assist in vein location, cause veins to fill with blood, enables easier blood flow at the needle insertion, and they should be single use. Right. Here is what the uh, the single use. Uh, non latex tourniquets look like like they are extremely really really thin. They look like paper. It would be impossible to like clean these, and you you'll be able to to identify the the di the difference in them uh, by the texture. You see, we use the the non latex rubber ones, um, and after dealing with these for the duration that you're in school. You go to a facility where they have these paper disposable ones, you'll be able to tell the difference. You can almost visibly see the difference. Yeah, they're transparent. I'm identify the patient properly, wash or sanitize your hands using appropriate agents, and then dry them. Ask patients to extend her or his arm fully. Use a clean latex-free tourniquet. Stretch ends of tourniquet around patient's arm about three to four inches above venipuncture sites and the cubital area. Uh, tight but not painful. Right. Um, and it's imperative that, that, that we work on the time the tourniquet. Um, you want to make sure that it's tight so that we can, so that pressure can, so enough pressure is being applied to where that 
that pressure is forcing the veins to fill up with blood, but you definitely don't want to have it um, to where the patient, you're cutting off the patient's circulation. And you'll know when it's too tight because you'll see the tourniquet itself start to roll up and you'll see the, the, the skin tightening up around it. That's when you know it's extremely tight. All right? You best to use your judgment when time the tourniquet. Don't go off so much what the patient says. Again, like you'll know if it's too tight on them. As like I say, you'll see the tourniquet will start rolling up. You see the skin tightening up around it. Uh, skin will start to look dry. Uh, but again, it's, you are the one performing the venipuncture, so you need to make sure that you, uh, when you assess that arm, if you see that the vein is isn't that visible you know that you may need to tie the tourniquet a little bit tighter to help make that vein more prominent so you use your judgment when identifying the vein because again you want to make the the procedure um easier on you and on the patient and again these are things that you or talk to your patient about when we're asking them questions and um explaining the procedure to them. Okay. Do not leave it on for more than a minute. Palpate the anticubical area to locate the safest vein. Once vein is selected, begin decontamination procedure. And right here you see um, palpate another vein, tourniquet tied, Right. Tourniquet release. Um, partial loop should allow for easy release during the venipuncture procedure. Uh, release it after needle, needle puncture when blood has begun to flow into collection tubes. Um, doing venipuncture release tourniquet with one hand. The other hand will be holding the needle and tubes. Here you see that venipuncture has been performed and that they are they are holding the galls over the the site. Right. Uh, cleansing the proper patient site, identify a patient properly, wash or sanitize hands using appropriate agents, dry them, then put on gloves. Once site is selected, cleanse it with a comp with a uh, Commercially packaged alcohol pad or gauze pad soaked in 70% isopropanol uh, just alcohol. Right. Rub site with alcohol pad using back and forth friction. Um, if blood cultures is required, additional site preparation is required. All right, what we mean here with the alcohol pad, uh, you always use the back and forth motion for the alcohol pad. I believe I discussed this with you all, um, maybe that's our first day back. When we use alcohol, you always only use the, the back and forth motion um, just to ensure that the area is clean to, to scrub the area. Now, if we're doing blood cultures, what you would do, you would first clean that area with alcohol and then after that area is clean with alcohol, then you will go behind that and scrub the site with the chloroxidine or chloroprep to, um, to ensure that the area is extremely clean because you don't want to run the risk of having any dirt in this site for the, the blood coaches. All right. Um, follow your healthcare facility standard operating procedure for blood collection, blood culture collection. Follow the manufacturer's um, directions for appropriate decontamination results.